So, uh, very quickly, my name is Sai and uh, what I am going to do today is that I am going to run you all through a very small story, uh, not going to bore you all with a talk on disability, accessibility, inclusivity and all that because not many people are affected except the disabled people segment. So, but I will run you through a journey of my life and probably there will be a few key takeaways and uh, that is something that we could be interested in. So, to begin with, uh, it all started in 1984 when a couple in South India fell in love. They got married and uh, then I happened. Uh, and when I happened, obviously, I had this additional growth in spinal cord. Uh, the doctors did not know how to operate and uh, things got messed up. And uh, there you go, I ended up with disability. The fun part about that is that I never knew what being normal was. So effectively, for me to know what normal is, isn't even there in my mindset. But the aspect that I was born with a disability came in much later in life. Uh, I believe that there are new terms out here uh, these days calling disabled people as physically challenged or like, you know, uh, differently able. Uh, if you are calling a disabled person as physically challenged, it's as if you are calling a single person romantically challenged. It's actually not going to make any difference in that person's life whatsoever. Uh, some people also say disability is a state of mind. Uh, but imagine if I was in college and I'm looking at three floors and I have to climb all the three floors and someone says, hey, disability is just a state of mind. You can still climb the three floors. I'm basically heading nowhere at the end of the day. So under these circumstances, uh, my life took a drastic turn. And this is what uh, I'm going to run you through you all. So in 1984, uh, when I was born with this disability, uh, it was very challenging for my father. Uh, my mom and dad didn't have much of a formal education. Uh, so it became really difficult for them on how do they bring up a child like me. Uh, there was no terms like inclusivity, accessibility back then. And a lot of people believed that it was sheer bad karma in previous life uh, that, you know, they got blessed with a child like me. But my dad did something really interesting at that particular point of time. Uh, unable to take uh, the pressure that comes with having a child with disability, he decided that he will actually move out of the state. Uh, he worked for Indian Railways, uh, he applied for a transfer and we moved to Andhra Pradesh. Uh, this is even more problematic because moving from Tamil Nadu to Andhra Pradesh means my mom right now has a language barrier and uh, she's with this kid and nobody knows how my life will turn out to be and uh, it's, it's all pretty messed up by now. Uh, throughout all this, uh, I, we also belong to a typical lower middle class family. So effectively, uh, while physical disability is one challenge, uh, lack of finances is a completely different ball game altogether. So if I get a fever or if I go through something uh, which would involve a medical procedure, not only is that emotional torture, but it is also going to be a financial challenge. But across all these challenges, uh, what kept uh, me going was that I was not even aware of my disability. Because when you are four or six years old, you just don't know that you are disabled. You just want to go out there, play, have fun and all that. But the one thing that transformed my life was my dad's thought that the only way out of all the ills that are going to come down to me because of my disability was through education. Uh, he strongly believed that education was going to bring me out of the challenges that I'm going to face. And he tried to put me into schools. When he put me into schools, the problem was not that I had a disability. The problem came from the parents of other children because they started to believe that if their kid studies along with me, then they would mimic my habits. Uh, some of them went on to believe that some of the uh, disability aspects that I have were probably contagious and therefore their children will end up suffering. So they would politely go and tell the principal and college administrators that they don't want me in the class. The college principal will call over my parents and like every year this used to be a routine. So over eight years, I had changed almost like seven to nine schools. As a result, the, I, I was never properly adapted to one place. But the good part of it is like I had plenty of friends or at least I thought I knew people. So eventually I moved on to 10th class and I promised my dad that, you know, that uh, whatever happens uh, in class 10th, I will definitely get state first rank in the public entrance examination. The fun part about that promise was that when the results came, I got first but from the bottom. Uh, basically, I passed social with one mark. Uh, I couldn't 
you know, I basically scored 60 percent on my uh, overall 10th class exam and when the results came on the computer screen, my dad was shocked, uh, my mom started to cry, my sister wanted to disown me and uh, I was pretty much happy that I basically passed. Uh, so after that, when I told my dad uh, that, you know, I wanted to pursue IIT, JE and all, he just looked at me and said, you know, just pass 12th class barely, that's, that's enough for us. Okay, so I moved on to class 11, class 12th and uh, the interesting aspect about those two years was that I, for the very first time, saw that my parents were disappointed in me. Think of it like a lot of time for us Indians, the motivation comes from two reasons. One out of passion, the other reason is our parents are disappointed in us. It's like half the life for us goes off in proving to them that we are worth their child. Okay, so effectively my teachers were very happy after 10th class that this fellow even passed the exam. But my parents were disappointed. For the very first time in life, I felt that someone had expectations on me. And unlike, you know, expectations creating pressure, I actually felt good because I was not this like hopeless case. Hopeless cases are two types. One, you don't have hope on yourself. Number two, others don't have hope on you. So effectively, I was like very, very happy that my parents were actually disappointed because they still had hope on me. But somehow when I sat down to study, uh, nothing went into head. Uh, every day to the college, my mom would take me up on a cycle uh, in front of the entire colony. She would kind of like put me on the cycle and just drive me to college. Then exactly at four o'clock, she would be there, then bring me up back to house. And like she did that for exactly 750 times, like two years. And even then, when I read physics, chemistry, nothing went into head. And I was cricket crazy. Uh, that was the irony of life, right? God kind of gives you passion for something, but doesn't give you the talent for the same. And that's where we want to plug the gap with effort. So effectively, as cricket crazy, half the time I used to watch cricket matches. And one fine day, somewhere in 2001, there was this particular moment where my dad was threatening me that, you know, I'll literally break the TV if you don't go and study right now. And I told him, Dad, I promise you I'll study. Uh, let Rahul drive it, get out. And uh, I will study for sure. <laughs> and that was a fateful day because Rahul Dravid not only batted that day, but he batted for three continuous days in that Kolkata test match. And he never got to study for those three days. But as he kept batting and batting and batting, I realized one thing. He, he was a frustrating guy. He was not an extremely talented guy. He was not the Sachin of the team. But he was a guy who would never get out. I mean, when he gets out, India is happy. Just imagine that, like when Rahul gets out, like people cheer because Sachin is going to come down next. And if our own team is happy that he's getting out, Okay, imagine what the opposition would feel. So effectively, that particular moment I realized that maybe I might not be able to hang around uh, and be talented like Sachin in my subjects, but I'll hang around and study and get frustrated with physics and chemistry and all those subjects like Dravid would. So I started to study for the first time in life. I kind of, uh, let's say, rectified some of the subjects and then kind of picked up the logic in mathematics. And when the eventual results came, uh, I secured 942nd rank in the state in the state engineering entrance exam with state first in the physically handicapped category. Now, when I secured the state first uh, rank in the physically handicapped category, my mom did marketing in the entire colony. She was like, you know, my son got state first, my son got state first, my son got state first, and like within about 15 minutes, the entire colony knew. And I started to believe that every engineering college. Uh, seat belongs to me because at the end of the day I had the reservation and I thought okay now my life is almost going to be set. So when we eventually went to counselling this was the funny part. If you all watch this movie called uh, Inception where Christopher Nolan comes up with this concept called dream within dream our government came up with this concept called reservation within reservation long back. Okay, and I was not aware of it. So I was state first rank in physically handicapped category, but I was state first physically handicapped OC. Uh, the, res the reservation was split back then based on the principles of not only uh, physically handicapped, but also physically handicapped and again on the caste basis. So effectively, the dream was to study Usmania University Computer Science. The system put me into CBIT College, Tripoli Electrical Engineering Department. That change in college uh, introduced me to one great person because uh, if you know where this college is, this is literally on-site opportunity. So every day you have to travel literally like 60-70 kilometers to even go to the college. And on the day I took the seat in this college and went back home, 
I met the first villain of my life. Now every vil every life has a villain, and I finally met the villain of my life. The villain of the life was the next door auntie uh, to my house. The day I got back to the house, uh, she was there waiting for me, and she was like, you know, Sai, uh, did you take the seat? And I was like, uh, yeah, I took the seat. And uh, she was like, you know, wh which college? And I said, uh, CBIT. And she was like, where is it? And I said, uh, it's there somewhere only in the city. And she started to rag me. Uh, she was like, you know, how will you go? Will you be able to climb the bus? Uh, would all these things work out for you? Why are you kind of like troubling people like this and all that stuff? In five minutes, in days where there was no Orkut, no Facebook, no Twitter, this auntie followed my life. Okay, and she kind of like kept an up-to-date event of what are the events that are happening. So when she realized that my family was going to have a tough time with me getting educated in an engineering college daily, she put a status on Facebook, her community saying, this family is going to suffer for the next four years. Then 15 aunties commented on it, 30 aunties shared it. And within no time in our colony, we had become the family that was going to have a rough ride all over. Uh, but those four years were rough. Uh, somehow I managed to graduate. Uh, I was one of the advantages of being a disabled person is that there is so much focus that you can put on only few events because there are only few events which you can focus on. Uh, so effectively, uh, my mobility restriction in mobility allowed me to become a good reader over a period of time. I started to focus on my education. My dad had insisted that if at all I am ever going to succeed in life, it is going to be is going to be through education only. And repeatedly hearing that statement and advice kind of over a time molded me into a person who strongly started to believe in my dad's view. Uh, I read this meme earlier today saying that when you repeat a lie enough number of times and uh, loudly enough, people will start to believe it. The same also holds good with truth. When you repeat a truth enough number of times and say it loudly enough, people will start to believe it. And that's what I started to believe as well. I started to believe that my education will kind of bring me out of all troubles. So I worked hard, <coughs> graduated again uh, as the top of the university at CBIT. And uh, in the moment where I was getting placed, uh, I got placed with Infosys. And uh, finally, when I got placed with Infosys, uh, Infosys asked me to move to Mysore for training. Now here was a guy who for almost like 20, 22 years uh, lived with his family. Every activity of his life was taken care of by his parents. So when I suddenly moved to Infosys, I experienced what freedom was like. Uh, I was happy that Infosys was not allowing parents into campus. If they did, my parents would have stayed there as well. Uh, so finally, I got hold of a wheelchair. I sat, I lived there for four months and Everything was going great until one fine day, I met the HR and uh, there was this particular conversation I had with him and uh, he said, you know what Sai, the postings have come out and you are going to get posted to Pune. Now that was a shocker for me because I was expecting posting in Hyderabad. So effectively I told him, sir, uh, I don't want posting to Pune. And then he said, uh, you know, why? So I said, I have this disability and I can't take care of myself. so." you know what, uh, why don't you give me a posting to Hyderabad? And then he looked at me straight on the face and he said, you know what, if Pune was Paris, wouldn't you go? And uh, then I looked at him back and I said, but Pune is not Paris. So <laughs> effectively, uh, I much later realized that that's not how you talk to HRs. But you know, when you are young and like blood is flowing in you, that's how you talk. Uh, then he looked back at me and he said, you know, in a 30 years long corporate career, uh, one or two years here and there uh, should not matter, so go. Uh, so I just couldn't take that. And I had this huge ego back then, believing that you know uh, I was the topper of my college and therefore I have a right to whatever posting that I want. Silly thoughts that go on in head. So in an emotional moment, in a very emotional moment, I typed an email, which was a resignation email. And uh, I clicked send, Outlook sent it. I had no idea back then of the consequences of it. The shocking part was that the HR actually accepted it. And uh, there you go, within four months of my uh, getting into Infosys, I was out of the job. Now, the bigger challenge was how do I tell this to my dad? Because here I was just finished the training. How do I go and tell my dad that, you know what? Oh, yeah. And uh, in that moment, I needed ideas. So I looked at the inspiration of our, our entire country, which was Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Gandhi wrote a letter to his father, 
okay saying you know this is what happened in life and gandhi's father forgave him i thought the same approach will work for me also <laughs> so i wrote a nice letter telling my dad that you know stuff happened so you know stuff must happen going forward so we have to do stuff in between uh, and <laughs> when he read the letter he didn't cry he made the other person cry so effectively there was a big fight in house dad was scolding mom when dad scolds mom mom cries when mom cries sister cries when sister cries dad gets angry more this is called avalanche effect basically you know and this was going on crazy back in life and at one emotional moment i finally told my dad uh, you know what uh, i have figured this out uh, when i lived in infosys i could survive there for four months because uh I, the wheelchair was accessible the very first time i used the word accessible in life uh literally it took me 23 years to tell my dad that you know that place was accessible i survived there i think i will go abroad and study the moment i said that dad laughed and then he said dad i am serious and then he got serious so i said i laughed okay you know you know what <laughs> i was just kidding around but that's just an idea so on one other fine day i went to this kitchen where my mom was cooking and I said ma do you think going abroad and studying would be a good idea and she got emotional and she was like you know would you leave me and go can you survive and all that why is life like this i think shani period is running for you and all that stuff so she was like let's go and meet an astrologer and i'm like where is that coming into picture right now so i really had no clue what to do back then uh, so i started with a step by step approach i told my dad that you know what uh, i'll search for a new job but one condition uh let let me just write the gre exam let let's just have as a that as a backup option and see so effectively my dad agreed i started to take the gre exam and then once the gre exam got cleared uh and i scored really well on that and i went to my dad and said you know what a lot of my friends uh who went abroad are doing well it is not that i want to go it's just that i want the admit so that i can tell people it was my choice not to go because right now when i tell people that i did not go they are thinking that who even gave you the admit first to go and all that stuff then he said okay apply to about three universities so i applied to three universities in all uh, stanford wisconsin madison texas a&m college station uh, all the three universities gave the admit back then and i was like shell shocked and because how the hell did they admit me i thought the iq of the school fell down by almost like 10 points the day i got the admit uh, but when i saw the admit i was like really happy so i went to my dad and i said now the ultimate talk had to happen so i told him like we have come this far can we make the leap going forward so when he looked back when i look back at that moment i felt that that was a transitional point because large ideas uh, when you tell people it will be extremely stupid uh, to give you kind of a context to this this was back in the freshers party in our college there were two kinds of freshers party in our college one was the management freshers and the actual freshers party management freshers is like where they give one sprite one samosa and say how great the college is uh, the actual freshers is where the seniors invited all the juniors and uh, there were three rounds to that uh, freshers party the first round was the introduction round the second round was the proposal round third round was the dance round to make it into the dance round what we had to do was give a very good introduction of ourselves and in the proposal round every guy had to propose to a girl with a rose and she had to kind of accept it and only if she accepts we make it into the dance round now when the rules were announced me and my friend were shell shocked uh, because we knew that we were the certified item boys of the class and if we take a rose and get on stage and call a female up she will be like did this fellow just seriously think that you know i am the one for him and all that stuff so effectively uh, as me and my friend sat down and wondered what the hell should we do my friend started to laugh and i was like what happened and then he said idea and whenever friend says idea do not trust <laughs> but at that point i was naive so effectively looked at him and i asked him you know what's the idea then he said uh, you know what sai uh, go and propose to the most beautiful girl in the class and uh, i was like you know are you crazy and he was like yeah trust me go and propose to the most beautiful girl in the class and it's like what's the point of that she will reject and then he said that's the point when you have to take a risk take a maximum risk okay when you take a risk take a maximum risk if it works out that's it you can do festival but if it doesn't work out nobody even expected it to work out okay so everybody will say that the girl was proud so the idea looked good <laughs> okay but uh, i also had to take a rose and convince the female out 
सो आई टू का रोज वेंट टू हर एंड सेड यू नो प्रसाद नाम तो सुना ही होगा एंड ऑल दैट स्टफ एंड डिडेंट वर्क आउट बट मच लेटर वेन आई वॉज सिटिंग डाउन विथ माई डैड आई टोल हिम यू नो वॉट डैट वी आर टेकिंग अ रिस्क बट इफ इट वर्क ग्रेट इट डजेंट वर्क एटलीस्ट आई बिकम अ लेक्चरर सो वेन वी आर टेकिंग अ रिस्क लेट्स टेक मैक्सिमम रिस्क फाइनली ही सेड ओके लेट्स टेक दिस द मूमेंट ही मेड द डिसीजन टू सपोर्ट मी राइट दैट वॉज द पॉइंट वेर आई ऑल्सो थैंक हिम एंड आई सेट देर वॉज अ पॉइंट इन लाइफ वेर ही वॉज कन्विंसिंग मी दैट आई शुड गेट एजुकेटेड हियर वॉज अ पॉइंट इन लाइफ वेर आई वॉज ट्राइंग टू कन्विंस हिम बैक सेंग आई नीड एजुकेशन फॉर माई सेल्फ एंड देन ही सेट ठीक है ऑल दिस सेंटिमेंटल डायलॉग्स आर गुड बट फिगर आउट हाउ यू आर गोइंग टू टेक केयर ऑफ द फिनांसिस बट ऑन दैट डे वेन ही गॉट कन्विंस्ड एंड ही स्टार्टेड टू टेल रिलेटिव एंड अदर पीपल दैट यू नो we have decided to send our son abroad was the day madness began uh, because people were like you know uh, are you crazy how would you be able to send your son abroad he cannot even climb a bus in the city how do you think he is going to live abroad and all that stuff my mom started to become emotionally very weak so i made her sat next to youtube made her watch videos showed her how us is accessible and you know much more friendly to people here there and you know try to do a lot of convincing but didn't work out that was also the point where a lot of people actually questioned me they st- started throwing sanskrit quotations like you know vinasha uh, kale viparita buddhi okay they started to say things like you know because your time is bad you are getting thoughts like this some other people were like you know you had a wonderful job with infosys why quit that and trouble your parents some people even went to an extreme extent they were like you know your sister won't get married if you are doing all this crazy stuff and yet at that moment i was really really focused on the education and there was this big problem on how do i generate the finances to study so we and my crazy friend we started to roam around all the ngos we kind of showed them our offer letter and we kind of said you know what uh, i have this admit from stanford and wisconsin if you can go ahead and sponsor us uh, at least you know for the first semester it would be really helpful we roamed around every ngo in the city at the end of the day the only one thing that we got was the petrol bill for the scooty so effectively nothing worked out and then i was really depressed i was fighting at home every day and then one fine day my friend called and he said the idea and i was like okay <laughs> what is your idea and he said you know let's approach the media uh, so as if that was not enough we approached the media uh, none of the we couldn't even get through the security gate Uh, so we stood outside the security gate for of the hindu newspaper one fine day uh, we started standing outside at around like 11 o'clock in the morning roughly around 3 o'clock one guy came out and uh, he was as he came out we said sir uh, i have an admit uh, at this particular university uh, so would you like to write an article about uh, us about me and then he was like you know which university did you get an admit in and then uh, i said you know i got the admit in wisconsin and stanford would you go ahead and write the article then he said everybody gets an admit for ms these days what's the big deal uh, then my friend had enough presence of mind he said sir but this guy is handicapped so this was like at that moment a begging moment so we were like literally selling our disability for an article and then that guy was shocked and he was like are you really disabled and i was like you know do you want me to walk and show right now and uh, effectively he took an uh, he took the interview and uh, next day morning even as i was waking up there was a huge noise uh, outside the house and uh, inside the house vessels were flying and i was like what the hell just happened so as i woke up and was wondering what actually happened i looked at the my dad gave me the newspaper it the hindu newspaper front page below portion there was this beautiful article called physically handicapped mentally tough uh, with my photograph in it now that was not the problem the problem was the article quoted uh, my dad's salary and it said you know this person salary is this much and therefore he is not able to kind of uh, progress therefore if any kind hearted soul is there please sponsor now that was also not the problem the problem was old villain read this newspaper and uh, effectively she asked my mother early in the morning is is your husband salary this much only and this was an ego hurt so effectively there was a huge fight going on in house and effectively all over again avalanche effect uh because my dad was like when did you even give this article do you even have an idea what happens if you kind of like pitch to the media and stuff like that uh the tv remote broke because i threw it on the floor in anger and all that stuff literally i started to feel guilty at one point i just wanted to get the hell out of the country finally 
uh, we started an entrepreneurial venture and we kind of made some money. I generated some money to kind of uh, cover for the first semester expenses and uh, started to go to the US and started pursuing my education abroad. Uh, in the first year at Wisconsin, uh, I took up Wisconsin because it was much lesser expensive and uh, they offered me the computer science course. So effectively when I started my uh, course on the very first day, uh, September 19th, uh, 2007, the day I landed in Chicago, a fantastic event happened, uh, Lehman Brothers collapsed. So the world went into recession. So effectively Vinasha Kale, Viparita, Buddhi and Shani period together happened. Uh, so effectively I just didn't know how that will impact my life. What happened was the dollar value went up by 4 rupees and that means the fee increased like crazy. And on top of that, uh, I thought uh, the US is what we see in uh, MTV or anything like that. But I chose a place where it snows. I thought I would choose that place because snow is cool. Uh, then I realized first snow is cold. Second problem was I thought, you know, when there is a lot of snow, everybody faces difficulty to move around. I by default face difficulty to move around. So it would kind of get nullified. Much later I realized that everybody has a way around it. I don't because when I do use my manual wheelchair on the snow filled area, it's going to become literally crazy. So on one fine day I got caught up uh, in snow. I collapsed because of hypothermia. And then when I woke up, it was literally two days later in a hospital along with a $15,000 bill and I was probably at the lowest point in my life. Looking back, I don't know what kind of kept me going then. I would just say that at that particular point of time, I was sick and tired of life. Uh, there, was a, there is always a point in life where no matter how hard you try, everything falls apart. At that moment, some people break forever. Some people become numb. They become like joker. Okay, they'll be like, you know, I want to do something chaotic and uh, I just decided to continue my education at that particular point. Uh, over a period of time, scholarship opportunities opened up. I cracked through the scholarship and somehow graduated again top of the class in Wisconsin Madison. Now, here was an interesting aspect. When I went through all the struggle and I could graduate top of the class, I wanted to make a fantastic video showing people that, you know, uh, any person can overcome the odds and they need not struggle so much and so much of perception hurt should not have happened. So I made this fantastic video in which I showed what are the facilities available for people with disabilities uh, in the US, how education system there is different from the education system here, how I showed, I showed how accessibility is important and not reservation because in our country reservation is provided for people with disabilities. Reservation for people with disabilities is like telling you know what? Uh, we give you 3% uh, reservation, uh, which means that if there is a college and the college has stairs uh, and you're facing a challenge to climb those stairs, well, climb the stairs no matter what, but if you get low marks, I'll still kind of give you the admit. It just does not make sense that you solve the disability problem with reservation. You need to solve the disability problem with accessibility. So I made a fantastic video explaining this and put it on YouTube. Two people watched it, me, my friend. Okay, my friend gave up halfway. So effectively, I was like, okay, what the hell just happened? And uh, I tried to promote that video as much as possible and nothing worked out. So on that fateful day, uh, I was a little low. And when I was going back, uh, my mother's birthday was coming up. And when my mom's birthday was coming up, I'd never miss celebrating her birthday at any time. So this time I wanted to celebrate it in a very big way. And since I was just about to graduate, I decided, I saw this ad for skydiving. So when me and my friend was there, were there standing next to each other, my friend said idea. And I was like, okay, what's your idea? And he said, you know, you know what? Get on top of the plane. Let's take the flight to 14,000 feet, jump out of the flight, and then wish your mom happy birthday in front of the whole world. So the idea looked good. Uh, in an emotional moment, I paid, okay. On top of the flight, when I wanted to jump, I jumped because I paid. Uh, primarily because if I hadn't jumped there and my dad came to know it, he would have pushed me. So he would have called the flight back and said like jump all over again. When I was in the midair, I had forgotten that it was my mom's birthday. <laughs> yeah. Because I had to get down because my mom's birthday would have been probably my death day. And uh, also realized that normally when people skydive and they get land, they land on their feet and walk. Whereas with me, the legs were tied because I cannot land. And before landing in, I had to bend down pull the legs upwards and land on my back. 
and uh, we had no idea how this is going to work out. But that's what you do when you are emotional, stupid and young. And finally, when we kind of took the risk, came down and landed, my friend had enough common sense to put a, an Indian flag in my hand and together both of us screamed that this is for the cause of people with disabilities in India. That video went viral and people were like, you know, disabled guys skydived, disabled guys skydived, some people were like, you are my inspiration and all that. So there was this actual video where I talked sense. And there was another video which had no relation whatsoever with disability. It was just about a guy jumping from a plane and when he skydived, people were like, you know, they were caught uh, and the attention was there. And that's when I actually understood that in India, the messaging needs to be a little different. So that was the first point I started to think maybe we shouldn't preach people about people about accessibility. We should probably try it from a different angle. So I started with analyzing the root cause to try and find out why is there a stigma associated with the word disability and that took me to religious textbooks. I, the first book that I read was this Bhagavad Gita book where I read the word called karma. People said you know you experience disability because you did bad karma in previous life and imagine like as a disabled person you are reading this, this is Lord Krishna telling you on your face, dude last Janma you did stuff, this Janma you are going to experience stuff. That hurt. But so I was, as I was reading that book further. I also started to read in that book that he said life is composed of five elements sky, earth, water, fire, air and he then adds only a person who has like a straight vertical spinal cord can experience all these five elements to totality and I was like okay this is where I catch you uh, because if that is what you want and that you tell that only a person with complete straight spinal cord can experience this let me prove to you that that's not true. So I came up with this elaborate plan that for sky we started with skydiving. For earth, I went to the Grand Canyon, we kind of rented a helicopter, uh, went inside the Grand Canyon, stayed there for a week and uh, what happened because of that, nothing, just my manager got upset because I was not available for a week. So effectively it was not heading in any direction. Then came water. The water was the big uh, challenge because I wanted to do scuba diving but my friend advised me saying that you know what, scuba diving is what honeymoon couples do think big and uh, then I asked him okay what do you mean think big then he said like there is a place on earth where the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean intersect why don't you take a jump there and I was like you know there is a dream there is fantasy there is stupidity and then there is a zone beyond that why do you ever think I'll get into that zone then he said no sir let's try out and so I started to look out for people uh, who would go and who had done that probably previously then I met this guy, uh, he was the first man to walk to North Pole and South Pole back in the 1980s. When I asked him over email, why did you walk to North Pole and South Pole in the 1980s that too, he said just because it's there. Okay, so effectively then I realized there are crazy people on the planet. Then I asked him, you know, uh, don't you think that's a little stupid thing to do? Then he wrote me an elaborate email, he said, you know what Sai, when I first walked to South Pole and then came back to my native country, England, uh, people, the very first question that people asked me when I returned from Antarctica was that, was it cold, Robert? So effectively, when he said people, when you come from Antarctica and people ask, was the continent cold, then at that moment you know that people are inherently a little stupid. Therefore, you don't need to bother about their opinions. And over email exchanges, I figured out that he was going on another expedition to Antarctica that particular year. So I asked him if I could join him in the same and uh, he more than was glad. He asked me to fundraise for it. Uh, I went to a couple of companies and asked them uh, to support me and they said, you know, this is not uh, a venture that they would be interested in. So I looked at setting up my own venture. Uh, I started to train for GMAT. Where, wherein I could raise money to go ahead and start going on this expedition. It was almost like a six month planning. Uh, I lived in Argentina for almost like 20 days because the terrain on the Andes is going to be similar to the terrain in Antarctica. So effectively I was like training on the Andes and if you actually look at this pic, uh, while we trained for 15 days on this uh, Andes range and then started on our expedition, we took all these lovely pictures. Then we went on to the expedition. One of the classic mistakes that I did during training was that I was never wearing hand gloves uh, while I was holding my crutches. 
But when I went to the Antarctic, the first thing I had to do was wear hand gloves. And then I realized the moment I wear those thick hand gloves, I can never hold my crutches. I can never actually hold my crutches. So the entire plan literally went to dogs. At that moment, I decided I'll take revenge on the Britishers because we carried them on our country for almost 200 years. So I asked this British man, can you carry me for about two miles so that we can get into the continent once we reach there? He said, okay, take hai. Then we designed sledges. We got pulled for almost like five miles. And uh, on uh, Shivratri day, at the intersection of the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean, I decided I'll take what is called as the polar plunge. And uh, we recorded that moment and finally, on the Shivratri day only, we kind of we became the first Asian with a disability to step onto the Antarctic continent. And uh, from there, we kind of put up these pictures. And by the time I returned to India, this video started to go viral. And people were like, you know, handicapped guy went to Antarctica also. This fellow went to Antarctica also. Then people were like, if that fellow goes to Antarctica, he can at least go to school and all that stuff. And uh, when people started to notice all this, uh, meanwhile, as if no, all this was not enough, old villain re-entered life and she was like, you know, I always knew that you had the talent to excel in life and that, you know, you could do well and like achieve big things. So why don't you guide my, you know, children also and inspire them and all that stuff. And that was the first point I realized in life that people's opinions can change drastically. They'll have one view of you today, another view of you the next day. Their opinions have no stability. And... Uh, Another thing was, as if uh, all these good things were not enough, out of nowhere, remember the video that I first put up, which had two views, uh, that was picked up by Amir Khan, and he was launching his show, Satya Mev Jayati, and the amount of research that went into that video kind of impressed him, and he said, why don't you actually come over and uh, have a talk on the show? So, this was like a classic Steve Jobs quote, where the dots got connected backwards, and uh, effectively, from there on, once I got into Satya Mev Jayati, uh, ISB was also interested. I started working with ISB and uh, graduated from the school. Uh, I started to work for Home Ministry, uh, wherein we kind of looked at generating jobs for people with disabilities, where disability could actually be an advantage. Uh, but before we get there, it was at this moment, uh, wherein I started to do the sky, earth, water thing, I started to realize that a lot of people in our country are very, very stigmatic about even expressing that they have a disability. Uh, we are in a city, we are in Hyderabad. Uh, so effectively, we talk of words like inclusivity, accessibility and all that. But when you go 50 miles south of the city or any direction of the city, if you go into a rural area, people wouldn't even want to share that their child would have a dis disability. That's primarily because they are worried about how the life would actually turn up. To just reflect that, uh, reflecting on that and wondering, you know, how can I actually help those people? Uh, I was talking to my professor at ISB and he was like, you know, you did all these projects about sky, earth, water and all that stuff, which is great. Uh, but it is only working on the awareness component. He said every social problem has got three components in all. One, the awareness component. Another is the action component. And third is the accountability component. Uh, things like this generate awareness that there is a problem out there, there could be a solution out there. It was a very interesting talk by my professor, conversation with my professor where he told me that, Sai, while a lot of people say that, you know, these activities are inspiring, uh, ask yourself what inspiration is. Uh, inspiration is not about overcoming a challenge because if you are inspiring by doing all these activities and overcoming the challenge, you're also sending a soft message that there is going to be a problem and still people have to overcome it. It's almost like, you know, a mother will come to the college and if the mother sees me, she tells her child, you know what, there is this kid, he, he climbed three floors, he kind of did well in life. So you also climb three floors, you will also do life, well in life and all that. He told me that inspiration is not about overcoming the challenge. True inspiration is about asking why the challenge is there in the first place and how can we remove that challenge once and for all. So it challenged me to think, beyond the obvious and he said, you know, stop on the awareness aspect and think more on the action and accountability angle. And it is there that, you know, the major challenge came because when I started to work on the action items, I wanted to generate jobs for people with disabilities. Within that, we looked at four segments. Uh, one segment was the educated and employed segment, uh, which is what is a justice or a fair system. Educated, educated people with disabilities, those people being employed. 
Then there are uneducated people with disabilities. They are employed. That's sheer luck. You wouldn't find anyone up there. Then there are educated people with disabilities, but they are not employed. This is the discrimination segment. Final, finally came the uneducated people with disabilities are not being employed. There are God knows how many people exactly uh, with disabilities in our country. Believe it or not, till 2010, uh, the government of India even refused to count the number of people with disabilities because the major challenge when we filed the RTA, we came to know uh, as to why people with disabilities were not counted uh, was uh, when the census is conducted, you have to go to a particular place and ask questions to the people. And in remote villages, interior villages and all, you speak in local language. So effectively, when the census is conducted and you go to a particular house and you have to ask that person, you know, do you have anyone with a mental disability or mental challenge at your house? Effectively, in Hindi, you have to basically ask, kya aapke ghar mein pagal rehte hain? So effectively, that gets very offensive. So you just can't like go into a house and say, kya aapke ghar mein pagal rehte hain? Then the auntie will be like, haan, char panch to hain, hamesha and all that. So effectively, since there was no terminology for people with mental disabilities, the government decided a sweet shortcut. They decided, let's not count. Okay. So effectively, it took a long time for the government to decide, we had to frame a word for this, then ask them. Uh, right now, the trending word is Divyanga. So basically, I have a divine organ right now uh, because of which I can, I don't know, do what. But the government has decided that right now we all will be called Divyang and now we are going to get counted and policies are going to be framed. Fair enough. But there was this huge group of people who are uneducated and unemployed. This is almost like 3 to 7 percent of the country. And they are going to be left out of the employment frame, which means they can't contribute to GDP, which means they are going to be a burden on the family that's earning, uh, which means that there is going to be unrest, which means that there is going to be frustration. And effectively, we, it was my goal that instead of working in the discrimination segment, we might want to work in the segment where people are uneducated and unemployed. That took my focus to the hospitality industry wherein I looked at jobs for people with disabilities where disability could be an advantage. The primary source of the idea came from the Mughal emperors, wherein all the servants of the queen of the Mughal emperor either used to be blind, all the spies or any others used to be deaf. They used their disability in such a way that effectively in that job, disability would be a primary advantage. Now, I'm not debating the morals or ethics of this, but it got the job done. We looked at certain jobs where noise could be a problem. For instance, if there is a traffic police and he is going to get affected by the traffic noise, we believe, and he has to speak only through signs, then a person with a hearing disability would be an ideal fit. In fact, a person with hearing disability could be a job requirement in that scenario. Because if you're constantly exposed to so much noise, you get frustrated, then you get angry, you get drunk, then you go and beat your wife. Okay, so effectively, we could prevent this whole chain of events wherein we looked at any job where noise was going to be a deterrent to the quality of the performance, the hearing impairment will actually act as a deterrent. And we kind of made like a fantastic report for the hospitality industry. We also looked at the pharmaceutical industry. We looked at a few jobs in the IT industry and we flipped the paradigm wherein instead of asking corporates to generate jobs for people with disabilities, we kind of looked at the people with disabilities and thought, hey, what jobs are they going to be in, in which their disability in itself is going to be actually an advantage. We made a fantastic report. We submitted it to the Home Ministry. Uh, I don't know what happened after that, how many jobs got generated or how many samosas got eaten on that research report. But effectively, we started to make a slow progress. That took me my attention finally to the third component, which is on the accountability angle. A lot of times, uh, people believe that any issue related to disability should actually be addressed by government. But when I actually look at it, it is not something that the government needs to address. For instance, you know, if I go to my father and say, uh, Dad, you know, this room and this table's location here is kind of hurting me, he does not tell me, go and speak to the district collector, he will come and change. My dad doesn't run any initiatives at house saying, you know, today we'll consider it as World Disability Day in our house. Or he doesn't run inclusivity initiatives. He doesn't uh, 
basically run it like a corporate. The reason he took care of me was that he could, he believed that I was part of the family. It, it all, I wouldn't even call it love. He believed that it was his responsibility. Once I became his family member, he believed that everything I face is going to be ending up as a responsibility or accountability on him. He took responsibility for my education. He took accountability when the principals called year after year, year after year and said your son would not be an ideal fit at the school. He moved me around at multiple schools. He spoke and convinced multiple principals. When my mom kind of like took me uh, across the street every day, all those two years, they didn't look at it as an initiative or an extracurricular activity at house. They knew that this was a fundamental responsibility because they knew that I was part of the family. Somehow, when I move into a corporate environment from a family, that angle on this member is my family gets missing. Because we are start to think, hey, he is different, my life is different, I have my own problems in life, let me sort that out, the HR is there for this. Uh, and I believe that is what we are trying to address through initiatives like this. Because you would really want to understand that each person right from the bottom of the ground to the top level CEO can play a huge role, can play a huge role. It could be something as small as the height of this chair. Uh, when you are addressing a particular gathering that makes all the difference to what the uh, person is going to feel and excel at the office on and when you start to show so much empathy then the person also feels responsible to contribute for instance remember back in 10th class i really didn't care uh, what my performance in education is going to be but when i realized that my parents were putting in so much effort and that they were disappointed my perform with my performance and then I went out of the way to actually help and focus and study and finally start to deliver and there came a point over a period of time where my own attitude, abilities and talents transformed and I sat in front of my dad, the man who first told me education is the way out. There came a day where I told him, dad, I need to go ahead and study abroad. I don't care what your fears are. This is what I need to do. That's the transformation that happens. Through this transformation, uh, there are going to be conflicts, there are going to be villains, there are going to be opinions, uh, there are going to be failures, there are going to be stupid movements, there are going to be movements of guilt. But you will realize that when you are fighting for what you are believing in and when you are fighting for what you think is right for your life, things might go wrong but even if they go wrong, you will do course correction over a period of time. And you will end up in a place wherein hopefully one day you can sit in a place, uh, sit on a chair like me, I am doing today and probably talk of what happened over 30 years of life in a 30 minute seminar. It's pretty much what I actually wanted to convey over this session. If you have any questions, I'd be more than glad to take it. Thank you.